Today on EWTN News In Depth, monasteries, shrines, and abbeys. We take a road trip to unique places of prayer and worship. We look inside the spaces where priests and religious devote their lives to the Lord. And we tell you where you too can visit to seek inspiration and hear the Word of God. A special travel edition of EWTN News In Depth starts now. Queen of Heaven appeared here, which is really astounding. The best kept secret in, in the world was over here for a long time. May the Almighty Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. The monks who live here in silence and solitude, devoting themselves to constant prayer and penance, only very rarely invite the public in mass into their reality. The basic concept is it's the uh, American barn building. Everybody gets together and helps the neighbor put up a barn, and this is kind of extended like that. I portray the student of Mother Seton, Anna Mae Motter. She went to this school here at the Seton Trine. For those who don't know Elizabeth Ann Seton, they'll have a great introduction to who she was and is, so that as a saint, she can, she can be their friend, she can be an intercessor. Welcome to this special travel edition of EWTN News In Depth. Today, we'll take you to some extraordinary places where the Word of God is heard, prayer life is strong, and our faith is flourishing. For the next hour, we'll highlight destinations where in-depth reporters and photographers have encountered people devoting their lives to God. A common thread throughout these stories, a clear-eyed joy as those we talk to practice their faith in very special surroundings, monasteries, abbeys, shrines, or grottos. We begin with places of contemplation and prayer, where those committed to Christ through holy orders are fulfilling their call to serve. In this time of shrinking numbers in the priesthood, we visit a seminary where vocations are booming. St. Michael's Abbey in Orange County, California, is one of the newest monasteries in the world. Correspondent Colin Flynn tells us about the inspiration that made the Abbey possible and its vibrant life in community. When you think of California, you probably think of this. And perhaps not this. Well, just outside the City of Angels, St. Michael's Abbey prays to the angels of heaven. It's the sort of perfect distance between the busyness of the city where we need to be doing our apostolic work and the quiet of the desert where we need to find Jesus in contemplation. St. Michael's Abbey outside Los Angeles in Orange County is one of the newest abbeys in the world, having opened in 2021. It's like heaven on earth. It's filled with the Catholic truth and the solemn celebration of the liturgy. It's a place to work out your salvation, uh, to grow in virtue and to overcome your vices and, and help lead people to heaven. Despite a decline in religious vocations in other parts of the world, here in St. Michael's Abbey, there is a vibrancy with 42 men studying for the priesthood and more waiting to enter. Why do you think so many men are attracted to the community? Well, I don't think it's rocket science. We say our prayers, we wear our religious habit, we live according to the charism of our order and the traditions of our order, and we've never really given any of that up. And so that's why young people want to come and be a part of it. The canons here are the order known as the Norbertines, with a history going back 900 years to France. Father Chrysostom Bear has been in the community for almost 30 years. In 1121, St. Norbert founded our order as a kind of reform of the clerics of his time. It was, it was another hard time for the church. Our 
Our mother abbey in Hungary is called the Abbey of Chorna. There were 40 abbeys in Hungary uh, in its heyday, and Chorna was always one of the most outstanding. In July of 1950, the police warned the priests that they would be taken away under the communist regime and never be allowed return, as Father Norbert explains. A small group of the fathers got permission from Abbot Eugene Simonvi to try to get out of the country and do something to keep the community alive elsewhere, especially if this was going to be the end, as they suspected. That's what brought them to California, where they set up a monastery and secured the future of their order. Father Norbert has been in the community for almost half a century and has witnessed how it has evolved. When I landed in 75, gravel parking lot, single story buildings, no church, a few trailers, and here we are sitting in a brand new abbey on a completely different property. It's a miracle. Today, there are 70 people living here in the Abbey, of which half are priests and half are seminarians. Those religious communities and those seminaries that, are, uh, that represent authentic, full-bodied, traditional Catholicism, the young people are flocking to it because it's exactly what the young people want. It's what the world needs. What is your vision for a place like St. Michael's Abbey? First and foremost, save souls and be a beacon of light and hope in a very strange land, a land that thinks that it's gone beyond God and doesn't need him anymore. So we're trying to fill that gap in the human heart with the truth of Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit. I have my days when I cry and I have my days when I'm sad by what's going on, but I never lose hope. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will never lose hope. At St. Michael's Abbey in Orange County, California, Colm Flynn, EWTN News In Depth. From one of the newest monasteries in the world to one of the oldest, the thoughtful, prayerful, and contemplative approach to living is very evident in Austria's famous Heiligenkreuz Abbey with its more than 900 years of monastic tradition. In the mountains not far from Vienna, Heiligenkreuz is the oldest continuously occupied Cistercian monastery in the world. Its long history of spirituality has influenced the theological training of priests for centuries. It has also been an important center for religious music and composition for 900 years. And in modern times, the monks are well known for their recordings of Gregorian chants. But despite the beauty of the setting, the buildings, and the art, at Heiligenkreuz, the monastic life is not easy. Some people enter the monastery and think they've come to a paradise. Well, they very soon discover that they haven't. It's hard work. It's hard work and people are very human and you don't really leave the world behind you. You do in some ways, but you carry, you bring yourself with all your faults into the life. The Heiligenkreuz abbot told our column Flynn that he sees the monastery as a spiritual lighthouse shining into the big city. Not completely cut off from the world, but rather an oasis where those who visit and worship there can draw from the spiritual life that is very much alive. Of course, the monastic life is not just for priests. In Southern Maryland, there's a community of Carmelite sisters who dedicate their lives to prayer at the historic Mount Carmel Monastery. Reporter Mark Irons gives us insight into their cloistered way of life and tells us about this special monastery. It's not your typical nine to five, but for Bill Hoxie, it's another day at the office. He works at a Catholic monastery. Here, cloistered nuns pray behind iron gates inside a walled off property on a plot of land in Southern Maryland. Bill takes care of the grounds and serves as the nun's carpenter. 
He grew up Protestant and never thought he'd end up here. He just told the nuns he could work on a project for them a few years ago. So I've been here ever since. <laughs> Visitors to the Mount Carmel Monastery can come to the chapel, museum, and gift shop or enjoy the peaceful spaces outside. But Bill's work also takes him through to the other side of the wall, a place off limits to the rest of the world, giving him a rare glimpse into life inside this sacred enclosed space. So the sisters are truly in love with Jesus in a way that I'd never witnessed. Of course, when you're in love, you're happy. And so the sisters are, 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 are the happiest women I've ever met in my life. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks Don't let the bars me. of this Thank cloister you. fool you. So sometimes people look at it and they think, oh, they're in prison. The divide symbolizes the nuns are set apart for union with God. Reverend Mother Maria Bernardina, the prioress here, says the women in this cloister aren't held back from enjoying a profound, joyful freedom. It's a deep down happiness when you're doing God's will. Then you're free. You don't have to be in the cloister to be free. But for us, it's, that's our calling. And so we're saying yes to God, we're living our life fully, and we're free. And the location is significant. They live out their calling at Mount Carmel in Port Tobacco, Maryland, the first monastery for religious women in the U.S. founded in 1790. These nuns make up a small part of a global community of religious men and women called Carmelites. And the order's story in the U.S. starts here. The sisters who founded this monastery planted their Carmelite spirituality on this holy ground and it continues to thrive today. I love so much being so close uh, to the church, to the Blessed Sacrament. You know, we spend so much time a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. It's like the first person I see in the morning is the Lord in the tabernacle. It's the best thing. Sister Dolores Peter of Jesus so Crucified in the Precious Blood began her formation with the Carmelites in Port Tobacco seven years ago. She's nearing her profession of final vows. I just can't imagine even wanting anything else, to be honest. Sister's journey here began in part when she started to learn more about the brown scapular. It can be worn by lay Catholics as a sign of faith, and it has special significance for Carmelites. According to tradition, the history of the scapular goes back to July 16, 1251, when the Blessed Virgin Mary presented it to a Carmelite saint as a sign of her protection. Mother Virginia Marie O'Connor says it's not a good luck charm. It's a symbol of devotion to Jesus through Mary. To wear it, it means you pledge yourself to her and to what she stands for. You pledge yourself to Christ. Under the title Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Mary is the patroness of all Carmelites. It's her order, and we want to imitate her and her love for Jesus. She was the perfect mother. She was totally open to what God wanted. And that's what we want. We want to imitate Mary. We want to draw closer to Jesus in our daily life. Friendship with Christ, that's it's, uh, what prayer is. Our life is a love affair with God, mm -hmm. you know, with Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Carmelites live in community and have time for work and recreation, but the main focus of their lives is prayer for the good of the church and the world. Our vocation is prayer. And people say, well, yeah, but what do you do? I say, well, we, we pray. I was like, well, yeah, but, but what do you do? Was like, <laughs> their lives are given for others. Among those who left a worldly life to enter the Carmelite order have been some famous saints, including St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Therese of Lisieux, and St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, who said, Those who join the Carmelite order are not lost to their near and dear ones, but have been one for them, because it is our vocation to intercede to God for everyone. At Mount Carmel, a simple, prayerful, sacrificial life of faith is practiced in the cloister, but it can also be lived outside the walls. Carmelite spirituality is, I think, something that the world badly needs today. There's so much, so much clutter, so much distraction in the world. John Coleman has learned a lot from the Carmelites. He's come to daily mass at the monastery chapel for years. His own prayer life has grown seeing the nuns' commitment. Their commitment to prayer. I, I believe that uh, prayer is so essential as um, nowhere near enough prayer these days. Uh, I think we had more prayer, we'd have a lot less problems in this world. When I come here, um, I feel at peace and um, I feel closer to God, quite honestly. Kathleen Christensen is a wife and grandmother from Florida. She visits Mount Carmel each summer. Kathleen is a secular Carmelite, meaning she's made vows to take her own faith more seriously 
within her day-to-day -day life. The Carmelite um, spirituality is one of prayer, devotion, um, contemplation, and I knew that that was missing in my life. It was just something I felt. Carpenter Bill Hoxie wasn't sure what was missing from his own life, but he found it when he started working here for the sisters a few years ago. Not long after, he converted to Catholicism. These nuns have shown Bill what it means to have complete trust in Jesus. He will lead you to something better than you could imagine. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. Up next in this special travel edition of EWTN News in depth, we take you to some shrines and grottos eager to welcome you as they honor some of our most popular saints. Her life is, is very inspiring, I think, and I think it will be a source of hope and encouragement for many people. A visit to the brand new visitor center and museum at the Shrine of Saint Elizabeth Ann Seton. And the remarkable story of why there's a national shrine to Saint Padre Pio in the middle of small town Pennsylvania. EWTN News in depth is coming right back. And a look now at places that draw everyday pilgrims that you can easily visit too. In the small town of Emmitsburg, Maryland, home to a Catholic seminary, a Catholic university, a home for retired religious, and the shrine of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton is a brand new facility. Its modern interactive exhibits are designed to help teach new generations about the Catholic faith of an American original the first American to be canonized by the Catholic Church. Reporter Rosal Reyes takes us there. Providence has disposed for me a plan after my own heart. It is expected I will become the mother of many daughters. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton was a woman of her time, a convert to Catholicism after enduring much suffering in her life. A pioneer opening one of the first free Catholic schools in America for girls. A foundress establishing the first order of women religious in the U.S. And the first American-born saint. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton is someone that I think many, many people can relate to. Uh, as a child who faced rejection, as a young woman who fell in love and married, as a wife, as a mother and then as a foundress of a religious community throughout all the stages of her life, her, her fidelity to, to God and to those that uh, she served is a remarkable example of faith and courage. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton died 201 years ago, but devotees like Sister Chris Maggie believe she serves as an inspiration to so many people. And now her legacy has been brought to life with a new museum at the National Shrine of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And these are the holy grounds where she came in 1809 with her children and first sisters. She established the first women's religious community in the United States, the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph's. Sisters then went out from these grounds all over the country and established orphanages, schools, and hospitals. There. Rob Judge is the executive director of the Shrine. He explains that the goal of the years-long project to renovate the museum is to enhance the experience for pilgrims who want to learn more about St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. For those who don't know Elizabeth Ann Seton, they'll have a great introduction to who she was and is so that as a saint, she can, she can be their friend, she can be an intercessor. For those who know something about Elizabeth Ann Seton, hopefully they come and discover another aspect of her rich history and, and her faith. The new visitor center and museum cost $4 million and is the first significant renovation of the museum in 40 years. Program director Tony Diulio helped design the galleries that tell St. Elizabeth Ann's story from childhood to sainthood. He said it all started with an interpretive plan. What does this mean? Why is this thing important in this place to these people? That interpretive plan uh, guided us uh, in, terms of t uh, in terms of what story we want to tell and in terms of how we want to tell it, identifying our audiences, and then lining those things up. 
The exhibits feature artifacts, digital interactive exhibits, hands-on activities, and Giulio's favorite, St. Elizabeth Ann's personal writings. One of the things I treasure most here is what, uh, what we call Mother Seton's commonplace books or her copy books. We have three of her copy books and they're going to be displayed on rotation here. Visitors can come and, and look through um, her most intimate writings. The museum chronicles her life into three core galleries, Seeker, Servant, and Saint. Here we have the most iconic uh, object in, our, in the museum, which is Mother Seton's shawl and bonnet. As archivist and historian for the Sisters of Charity of Cincinnati, Sister Judith Metz had a part in the fruition of the new museum. She hopes that St. Elizabeth Ann Seton's story can help others grow in their faith. One of the main things for me about Elizabeth Seton's life is her, her evolution of her faith and her deepening spirituality and connection to God through her you know, her evolving life. For visitors, I hope that they can find a real connection to her and be helped, in a sense, by her own spirituality to grow in their spirituality. And that's exactly the connection Jackie Abedamarco felt with a saint. Like Saint Elizabeth Ann Seton, Abedamarco is a convert to Catholicism. During her battle with cancer, she looked to the saint's unwavering faith as a testament of God's love. On the opening day of the museum, she and her husband visited the shrine for the first time. I felt the closeness to her, the way that uh, her with Catholic traditions made uh, her feel closer to God. I'm the same way. You get a sense of her journey through pain and suffering and how that relationship with God got her through that to do what she did. People should stop and see the shrine and come visit the shrine if they can. and pray and uh, thank God every day for the blessings that he gives to all of us. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton also serves as someone the younger generation aspires to be. Uh, yes. Meet Judy Delp and uh, Felicity Crook. I'm Ruby Delp and uh, I portray the student of Mother Seton, Anna Mae Motter. She went to this school here at the Seton Trine. And my name is Felicity Crook and I don't have my character yet. Felicity is new on the team and is learning from Ruby how to become a junior history interpreter. On the grounds of the shrine, two historic homes remain open, the stone house where St. Elizabeth Ann Seton lived and the White House where she taught. These young interpreters portray the life of the early students in the academy and interact with the public during tours. I think it's cool to um, be like standing in the place where she would have stood. I love walking in her footsteps and sharing her life and legacy with others as I'm here each day. Rochelle Rages, EWTN News in Depth. For more information on the new St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Museum, go to this website, www.setonshrine.org. Just a few miles away from the museum is a mountainside shrine and garden devoted to the Blessed Mother Mary. The National Shrine Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes is a quiet place of solitude where pilgrims come to pray in peace in a beautiful mountain setting. The shrine features the oldest U.S. replica of the Lourdes Shrine in France. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims come each year to light a candle, worship, and meditate. St. Padre Pio is honored with a shrine in the United States. The Italian priest blessed with stigmata, or the wounds of Christ, is credited with many accounts of saintly intervention around the world. Reporter Mark Irons explains one miraculous event attributed to St. Padre Pio. It inspired a national shrine in his honor in Pennsylvania. He was a simple priest in southern Italy, known for having supernatural gifts including the stigmata, the same wounds Jesus received at his crucifixion. Catholics and even non-religious around the world now know him as Saint Padre Pio, a famous Franciscan friar of the 20th century, and this man knew him personally. Humility, one word. Padre Pio didn't care for all the attention, fellow Italian friar Father John Aurelia told me. As a teenager studying for the priesthood, Aurelia first met the stigmatic priest in San Giovanni Rotundo, the town where Padre Pio lived with other Franciscans. He heard of Padre Pio bearing the painful nail wounds of Christ, but he wanted to find out if the wounds were real himself 
so he squeezed the friar's hand. We went to San Giovanni Rotondo and uh, I took Padre Pio's hand and I did it like this. And he said, ow, ouch, it hurts. Besides the stigmata, Padre Pio was known to have mystical gifts, including the ability to read people's hearts and even heal the sick. Huge crowds would gather at his friary in San Giovanni Rotondo. People waited in long lines to see him celebrate mass or have their confessions heard. The priest would sometimes spend more than half the day in the confessional, available to those seeking forgiveness for sins. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, word continued to spread of the Italian friar, but at the time, he wasn't well known to all Catholics in the U.S. That might leave you wondering why today, in the tiny town of Bardo, Pennsylvania, the National Center for Padre Pio stands out in the surrounding empty green farmland. One of the main centers of devotion to Padre Pio in the U.S. can be found right here in the Pennsylvania countryside. And the story behind how this place was created is a miracle. In 1968, not far from here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Vera and Harry Calandra received the awful news. Their two-year-old daughter, Vera Marie, suffering through an ongoing battle with congenital urinary tract problems, was not going to survive. And just know she's not going to make it. She is going to die. Those were the words of renowned surgeon C. Everett Koop, who would later become the U.S. Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan. He said he had tried everything, but had run out of options for his patient. In the summer of 1968, he removed Vera Marie's bladder to provide some temporary comfort before her death. Dr. Koop told the Calandras to make arrangements for their daughter's funeral. But Vera Marie still lives today. He said, you need to call, like, you need to come to terms with this now. You can't hang on to this dying child. And my mother went home and she didn't accept it. Vera Calandra, a devout Catholic, picked up a book someone had given to her about a then 81-year-old priest from Italy, Padre Pio. As she read, she heard... She heard the inner words as she described the locution and inner voice of, come quickly to Italy, bring your little girl to me, and do not delay. Vera Calandra acted quickly. She made arrangements to travel, and within weeks she was in Italy with her daughter. Waiting in a packed corridor with others, her sick two-year-old daughter, Vera Marie, by her side, Miss Calandra saw Padre Pio approach. And their eyes locked. And that's when she made her promise. Make a miracle so that all will believe. He took his, his wounded hand, covered in his half glove, and he pushed it up in front of her face. And she was able to kiss his hand, and he touched all of us individually on the heads and blessed us. And the next day we were on our way home from Italy. Dr. C. Everett Koop had surgically removed Vera Marie's bladder before the trip to Italy. But after they returned home, a follow-up x-ray revealed something unexplained. They found a bladder from where he had removed it. He could not explain that himself and he just said there's, there's a rudimentary where the words that he used, bladder, and we don't know what, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. 54 years later, a healthy Vera Marie recounts the story of her healing, just as her mother would share it with her and all who would listen. Padre Pio passed away soon after Vera Calandra took her daughter to Italy in 1968, and she would dedicate the rest of her life in Thanksgiving to the friar and ultimately build this center near the family's home in Pennsylvania to help promote his name. She passed away in 2004. A reporter once asked Padre Pio what else he could hope for after achieving widespread spiritual fame. Father John Aurelia recounts what Padre Pio told the reporter. I want to be a poor friar who prays. Simple as that. That's Padre Pio's spirituality. At the National Center for Padre Pio in Bardo, Pennsylvania, pilgrims can learn more about the saint's life, see real items he used, including his confession booth, and visit an exact replica of his chapel, but the focus is leading souls to Christ. People who would come to see Padre Pio and they would, you know, almost throw themselves at Padre Pio, I love you, I love you. And one of his more famous quotes was, no, you do not love Padre Pio because of Padre Pio. You love Padre Pio because I leave you to Jesus. Nick Jaboni, the executive director of the center, works with the Calandra family today to further the mission that Padre Pio had all along as a humble, prayerful friar. To Padre Pio, it, it was all about leading souls to Christ through the Catholic Church. Mark Irons, EWTN News In Depth. 
And one does not have to travel to Portugal to experience the message of Our Lady of Fatima. In the United States, near Asbury, New Jersey, is a beautiful and peaceful setting for prayer and meditation at the Blue Army Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. The American Shrine is a tribute to the one in Fatima, Portugal, where three young children saw apparitions of the Angel of Peace and our Blessed Mother in the years 1916 and 1917. Pilgrims come to the Blue Army Shrine west of New York City to worship Our Lady and remember the young shepherd children to whom Mary appeared, asking them to pray the rosary daily for world peace. Two of the children were canonized in 2017 on the 100-year anniversary of the first apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. They died of influenza as children. The third child, their cousin Lucia, went on to become a religious sister and lived until her death at age 97 in 2005. She is now a venerable and her cause for canonization continues. The wine is a, the, the proof that God uh, wants us to be happy and the sun rising in the mountain is the same. Next, the fruits of the earth and a bountiful harvest to honor our maker. We travel to France to talk to the Benedictine monks who make wine at their monastery for the glory of God. And down on to the farm, the mission at a shrine to St. Anthony to grow organic vegetables for those hungry and in need. We take the agriculture road as our travel episode continues. richness of the soil and the blessings of its harvest. As we continue our travels to shrines, abbeys, and monasteries, we take you now to French wine country to witness something extraordinary. It's not just business as usual for one group of winemakers. These Benedictine monks are instead bottling their wine for the glory of God. Colin Flynn reports. The sun has yet to rise over the vineyard of St. Madeleine's Abbey in La Beru in the southeast of France. The monks have been up praying since 3.30 a.m. But here, time takes on a different meaning. Daily life in the vineyard is meant to transform you, to enchant you. It teaches you to love silence and solitude and hard work well done. Wow delighting you with the beauty of the cosmos. De la beauté du cosmos. As the sun rises, it blankets the monastery and the vineyard in a warm light, signaling a new day and a new beginning. The, the wine is a, the, the proof that God uh, wants us to be happy, and the sun rising in the mountain is the same. It's harvest season, and so the work begins for these Benedictine monks. Throughout the day, the monks will work in the vineyard, picking the best grapes from the vines in order to produce a heavenly wine they call Via Caritatis, Latin for through charity. Father Charles is the Father Abbot and has been in charge of the monastery for almost 18 years. Tell me a bit about the monastery and its history. The monastery was founded in 1970 by Dom Gerard Calvet, a monk from the Abbey of Tournai. Then some young people joined him and now there are almost a hundred of us here with three monasteries. The story of monastic life here in La Beru and the wine they produce is incredible and goes back over 700 years. And close by to the abbey are the ruins of another monastery and the original vineyard for the papacy. This is incredible. So this is where we believe was the site of the first ever papal vineyard back in the 14th century. Exactly, this was the first papal vineyard that was planted uh, even before Chateauneuf du Pape, which is a very famous uh, vineyard here in France that was planted by the popes of Avignon, but it was planted after this first vineyard. And so this is the link from the papacy to the work that is done in the monastery today. Father Michael, a priest from Virginia in the United States, first joined the monastery in 1988. 
So I've worked outside here actually for 30 years. I've always uh, been a kind of a farmer in my blood. That's just my uh, genetic makeup from my grandmother who came from Switzerland. The monk's wine business turned out to be a true blessing for local wine growers at a time when it was becoming increasingly difficult for them to earn a living. Living close by, Guillaume is a local wine grower who sells his grapes to the monks and sisters. So beautiful. This is all yours? Yes. Wow, this is so spectacular. What a view. The collaboration with the monks is a partnership. We work together. We need each other. It's very enriching to have the two entities, monk and classic cooperators like us, the wine growers. It brings a richness and added value for our wine. The grapes are then transported to a local winery, where the monks conduct some final tests before handing it over to award-winning vintner Daniel, who oversees the maturing process and final product. You have the cork taken off the top of the barrel. Yeah. You normally come in and you, you taste it to see how the aging process is going? Exactly, so you have to taste every now and then and also feel the barrels. Yeah. What, a, what a difficult job you have. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. My job as a winemaker is kind of easy because they bring me very nice food quality. So I just need to, you know, preserve that quality from the beginning to the end. And that's what you get at the end. And for the monks themselves, they want to continue producing their wine humbly and quietly, hidden away here in the southeast of France. They do not even want to give their full names for these interviews. They say all glory should go to God not to them. Jesus was totally ignored. He was a great priest for 30 years and he was just treated like a, a carpenter because he Christ working on this table <laughs> to get it done in time. <laughs> and that was Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was Jesus Christ. So I don't think we should try to do anything more than him. Yeah. There is a strong connection between the goodness of all the things of the earth and the goodness of God. Everything that lifts the soul a little lifts the soul to God. As long as it is good, as long as it is beautiful, and as long as it is true, it is the goodness of God. And I believe that our wine is beautiful, good, and true. In La Barru, France, Colum Flynn, EWTN News in Depth. And from farm to fork in the U.S., Franciscan friars and lay volunteers are tilling the soil, harvesting their, the fruits of their labors, and feeding the hungry in Baltimore, Maryland. Little Portion Farm lies on the grounds of the Shrine of St. Anthony in Ellicott City. The volunteers grow more than 40 different types of fruits and vegetables and multiple types of herbs. Influenced by Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, the emphasis here is to care for the earth and use the land in an organic manner while helping the poor. Since the farm uses no pesticides or machinery, the volunteers who work the fields are the core of the ministry. I sense that uh, St. Francis provided a kind of a great way of recognizing creation as a, a brother or sister and the ability to see God's action and work in creation. Just seeing the expansion and the different kinds of foods that we have, like that's one of the things that I really love about it. It's a bit of a dignity that you give to people to say you're important enough to try Jerusalem artichokes or, you know, okra or some strange squash flower. The sustainable farm has grown, harvested, and donated more than 60,000 pounds of produce in the last few years. Most goes to the Franciscan Center of Baltimore, where up to 800 meals are served a day at the center's hot meal program and in deliveries to homeless encampments. The chefs here very glad to receive nutritious, fresh produce for those in need. As we said, Little Portion Farm is on the grounds of the Shrine of St. Anthony near Baltimore, Maryland. We'll take you to the beautiful gardens there a little later in this program. Volunteers are the core of an annual workday at an abbey in Northeast Oklahoma. 
as the saying goes, many hands make for light work. The Benedictine monks of Clear Creek Abbey depend on those extra hands every year. Reporter Alan Holdren shows us the devotion of hundreds of lay Catholics to this annual event. Nestled into the rugged hills of eastern Oklahoma, hidden away according to their charism, is a fast-growing group of Catholic monks. In the woods, gathered around the word, are the Benedictines of Our Lady of the Annunciation of Clear Creek Monastery. We're not just here by ourselves for our own contentment, but we stay here basically and pray and work around this place with a lot of different shops and things. It's really about uh, contemplative prayer. Seven times a day and once a night we meet to pray in the church. And then we have other times of prayer and study. But we do manual labor because the earliest monks found that they couldn't do this. They couldn't pray all day. They were going crazy. Since the community's establishment, their lifestyle has been attracting the interest of the local community. For the last 23 years, locals have been working and praying with them when they can. And just once a year, the first weekend in March, they open their doors to any and all people to come lend a hand for an annual work day. It's just by word of mouth, it wasn't a, uh, somebody's idea really, except that, uh, to let people come help. Because they, it's hard to understand contemplation and prayer, to understand work, everybody gets that, right? So they, they come and they identify with that. I don't know, it's kind of a mystery, really. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This year, Tulsa Bishop David Condorlet gives the blessing before the work crews head out. Brother Joseph Marie Owen is the community's rancher. He also oversees the annual work day. And basic concept is it's the uh, American barn building. Everybody gets together and helps the neighbor put up a barn. And this is kind of extended like that. So we've got people clearing the woods, taking out the, the dead trees and whatnot, opening up thinning firewood. We've got people up there uh, that are building uh, corrals. We have two corrals that will go up that will be able to capture the animals, the, the cows, and bring them down to where they, if they need special attention. We have all these people, good people coming together. That's unmeasurable, of course. You know, that's a quality thing. It's about a year and a half of my time, one day. The monks who live here in silence and solitude, devoting themselves to constant prayer and penance, only very rarely invite the public in mass into their reality. Today, there are more than 500 people here. It's just good to help, uh, help the monks out as much as we can, and uh, it's really good for the community out here. A lot of people come from all over Oklahoma and out of state to help. I was clearing out all the timber, getting in all the big pieces for uh, firewood, and then stacking up all the brush, just for brush to burn. The monks want to turn all this land into uh, pasture land eventually. So if we can clear that land um, of trees and dead wood, eventually we can get grass to grow. And then uh, hillsides with rocks and beautiful monastery land is a perfect place for sheep to eat. And if you ask anyone here, they'll be coming back next year, bringing their own tools and some more friends. Alan Holdren at Our Lady of Clear Creek Monastery in Holbert, Oklahoma, for EWTN News In Depth. Visions of Jesus Christ and visions of the Blessed Mother. Our travel edition continues in a moment. She really appeared here. The church has approved it, and now people are coming to experience it. There's only one church-approved Marian apparition in the United States. We take you to the National Shrine of Our Lady of Champion in Wisconsin next. This is where our Lord came. This is where my grandmother lived most of her life inside this room. And the story of Rhoda Wise, the Catholic mystic who so inspired our very own Mother Angelica. A trip to her house and grotto coming up. In October 2023, EWTN News In Depth attended an inaugural Mass in Wisconsin, celebrating a new solemnity for Our Lady of Champion and a renaming of the shrine there in honor of the only church-approved Marian apparition in the United States. 
Even many faithful who live nearby are not familiar with the little-known apparition, but the shrine has now received attention with the 2023 festivities and because it was chosen as a stop on the Eucharistic Revival Pilgrimage in 2024. Reporter Mark Irons tells us those who oversee the shrine are eager for national visitors. Throughout history, some estimates show there have been more than 2,000 reported claims of Mary, the Mother of God, appearing around the world. The vast majority of claims are unconfirmed by the Catholic Church. Following critical investigations, less than 30 apparitions have been officially approved. The Queen of Heaven touched down here, right in front of you. And in the U.S., there is only one church-approved Marian apparition. It took place in a tiny community many haven't heard of, Champion, Wisconsin. A place of welcome, solace, and refuge. Surrounded by farmland, about a 15-mile drive outside of Green Bay, a simple brick chapel is built over a shrine, marking the place where a poor, uneducated Belgium immigrant named Adele Bryce was visited three times in 1859 by the Virgin Mary. The Queen of Heaven appeared here, which is really astounding. Bishop David Ricken of Green Bay says Mary's message to Bryce and the American apparition was unique, in part because it focused on educating children in the faith. Mary said, gather the children in this wild country and teach them what they should know for salvation. Teach them to make the sign of the cross. Teach them about Jesus. Prepare them for the sacraments. And so it's, it's children focused. And that's a beautiful mission. And when you, when you hear that kind of language, we're talking about catechesis, huh? religious education. That's what Adele did. For the rest of her life, Bryce carried out her mission, walking on foot for miles to spread the faith to children. As a lay woman, she never made religious vows, but insisted on wearing a habit. Others joined her in her mission, and a schoolhouse was built near the spot of the apparition so the children could gather. In her last appearance, the Virgin Mary parted with these words, Go and fear nothing. I will help you. And so visitors to the apparition site have prayerfully asked for the help Mary promised, calling on her by the title Our Lady of Good Help. But while American Catholics may be familiar with church-approved apparitions in other parts of the world and Mary's titles associated with those places, like Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Fatima, and Our Lady of Lourdes, over all these years, many Catholics in the U.S., even in Wisconsin, have been unaware of what took place in Champion. Sometimes people have never heard of this, even people in our own area. That's why October 9th, 2023, marked a historic day in the history of this national shrine. On the 164th anniversary of the apparitions, a solemnity mass was celebrated, honoring the Blessed Mother for the first time as Our Lady of Champion associating her with the very place she appeared. Well, it truly is historic, uh, I think in the sense that uh, we can honor her under a new title and sort of make her mission known better. A new title for Mary, putting Champion Wisconsin on the map. The best kept secret in, in the world was over here for a long time. Going forward, the new name could spark greater interest. For Pat Bershinger, a volunteer at the Our Lady of Champion National Shrine, family history is rooted deep in this holy ground. I'm going to be 80 years old, and I start coming when I was about three. <laughs> so you do the math. <laughs> Bershinger is blind, but her memories are vivid. Her parents and grandparents would pray the rosary here on Sundays. And when she was a very young girl, her great-grandfather told her about a miracle. In 1871, 12 years after Mary appeared to Adele Bryce, the deadliest fire in U.S. history still to this day broke out in Wisconsin. The Peshtigo Fire is estimated to have killed between 1,500 to 2,000 people or more while burning a million acres of land. As the fire raged around Champion, Bryce and others in the nearby communities, including Bershinger's great-grandfather, a seven-year-old boy at the time, gathered around the chapel and prayed to the Virgin Mary. They came here to the shrine to pray. They even took some animals along, according to what my great-grandfather told me. The fire was engulfing the region, but it stopped right before the grounds here at Our Lady of Champion. Prayers were answered and rain began to fall. The fire stopped right at the fence and they were saved. The day after the fire was the anniversary of Mary's apparition. Miraculous stories of her intercession continue to come out of Champion. 
There's one incredible account from James Gillis, who now has increased devotion to Mary. Because of what she did for me. In 2021, Gillis believed he needed an urgent colonoscopy. On multiple occasions, he had discharged large amounts of blood. But he was having trouble scheduling a medical procedure. All the while, he continued to pray. I came here to the shrine asking our lady that she'd intercede and I would be healed from this because it was... You know, I was starting to, I was getting concerned. After leaving the shrine, his condition worsened. He rushed to the emergency room. He was losing more blood. Nurses tried to keep him conscious. I started to go unconscious and they were trying to keep me awake and all this stuff. But then when I was unconscious, then our Blessed Mother was right there. I had this deep impulse to totally surrender myself into her hands because I knew that I was going, that I wouldn't be around. It was the most incredible, beautiful experience. Gillis firmly believes he was on the brink of death with Mary leading him into heaven. But as he began to pray for the loved ones he'd be leaving behind, he thought of his wife and he wasn't ready to leave just yet. And that's when I pleaded with her to live and uh, yeah. And um, she heard my prayer. He gained consciousness and later learned the doctor wasn't sure he'd survive. But a follow-up procedure found no issues, and a healthy James Gillis now enjoys the grounds of Our Lady of Champion with his wife. And so do families who might come for special masses or evening prayer walks. So I think as Catholic parents, we have a duty to, to pass on our faith. The Blessed Mother's message to Adele Bryce to teach the faith to children still rings out. If we're to ensure the next generation of Catholics, then we need to do that. Daily prayers, weekly mass, all those things that are so important. A path to holiness will continue to be forged here in a unique way, especially as the shrine will be a stop on one of the pilgrimage routes next summer, leading to the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, an event years in the making open to all Catholics to renew love for Christ fully present in the Eucharist. The closer you get to Mary, the closer you're going to get to Jesus, and especially his presence in the Eucharist. So whether this is your first time hearing of Our Lady of Champion or not, know a warm Wisconsin welcome has been officially extended. Oh, come visit, come, we'd love to have you. And the peace here, everybody tells me they receive the gift of peace. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. And visitors are also welcome at a small, humble home in Canton, Ohio. From the outside, it's not what you might picture as a religious destination. But Rhoda Wise, the woman who lived here, provided the inspiration for our own Mother Angelica to follow her own religious calling. Wise was a mystic and stigmatist who lived in this modest house in the 1930s and 40s. After being diagnosed with stomach cancer, her doctors told her there was nothing else that they could do for her. She said she was cured after she was visited by a vision of Jesus. She woke up on the, uh, in the early morning of May 28th to a light in that room, and when she turned to see what it was, Jesus was sitting in that chair by her bed. And she, you know, wasn't surprised to see him. She said, have you come for me? And he said, no, your time hasn't come yet. Accounts of Rhoda's miraculous healing brought thousands to her home during her lifetime, seeking physical healing or spiritual help. That included a teenage girl named Rita Rizzo, who had an unbearable stomach condition. That girl, now known to us as Mother Angelica, was healed after Rhoda told her to pray a novena to St. Therese. Through the rest of her life, Rhoda reported continuing visits from Jesus and St. Therese. Though she died in 1948, visitors still come to the Rhoda Wise House and Grotto in Canton, Ohio, seeking a miracle. The Catholic Church has recognized her as a servant of God. When we return, we go to a beautiful shrine and garden, perfect for reflection and prayer.
finally today, we take a moment for a little reflection as we close this special travel edition looking at Catholic shrines, monasteries, and abbeys. EWTN News In Depth visited the Shrine of St. Anthony just outside of Baltimore, Maryland to see the beautiful campus so loved by the Franciscan friars who live there. Enjoy these images. And that's a wrap on this special travel edition of EWTN News In-Depth. We hope you've enjoyed seeing some of the special places where the faithful are drawn together to contemplate the Word of God, beautiful spaces with beautiful missions to the glory of Jesus Christ. I'm Monse Alvarado. Join us same time next week for more reports important to your Catholic life. See you then. <music>